Welcome to Weinberg College's Conversations with the Dean. And today I'm really delighted to be joined by Professor Sarah Young. Dr. Young is an Associate Professor of Anthropology and Global Health Studies. The focus of her work is on the reduction of maternal and child undernutrition uh, in the first thousand days of a child's life, I'm assuming, uh, and especially looking at low resource settings. Most recently, she's led efforts to develop something called the Household Water Insecurity Experiences, HWISE scale, which is a cross-culturally valid tool to measure household water insecurity. The HY scale is currently being implemented globally, including by the Gallup World Poll, to benchmark water access and use. And Sarah's work, uh, just so you know, has been recognized nationally and internationally, and recently she was named an Andrew Carnegie Fellow, a really outstanding recognition and something we uh, at the college are particularly proud of. So thank you so much, Sarah, for being with us here today. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you. Dean Randolph and, and all of you who have joined us from the, the far corners of the earth. Um, and it's a pleasure to be um, talking about my, my favorite topic, which is water. <laughs> so I, um, I am me, Sarah Young, I'm a, a, an anthropologist and a nutritionist, but I'm more than that, I am my group. So we, I run what's called the Young Research Group for Maternal and Child and Health, and we're really focused on scientific excellence for, for social equity. And the we is undergraduate students, graduate students, postdocs, and, and analysts. And we're busy, as Adrian said, focusing on what we call the first thousand days. And the first thousand days refers to the year prior to pregnancy, as well as the, the two years after delivery. So what you're capturing there is the diet, but you're also capturing the mother's health before she's even pregnant. And as an example of the type of work we do, I, I had a large study in Kenya where we were studying the impacts of food insecurity, not water insecurity, food insecurity in those, those first thousand days. And we investigated economic pathways, nutritional pathways, physical health or disease pathways and psychosocial pathways by which food insecurity impacted both maternal health and infant and child health. Um, and I had the dubious opportunity to be experiencing um, motherhood for the second time over while, while we were running this study. This is baby Aurora, who's now in second grade. And as we do this work, we're always trying to advance the three pillars of the Weinberg College, which is data, cultures, and, and biology. And you'll see that, I think, throughout in the natural world. And you'll see that throughout this presentation that we care about those from a scientific point of view, but we also care about them from a social justice point of view. And we also care about them from an educational point of view. And this is all kind of woven into to the Young Research Group mantra. So it's really great hearing, and I think the pictures, you know, uh, whatever, speak a thousand words, right? I mean, they're, they're so uh, vivid seeing you abroad with your group that way. It would be good to hear a bit more about uh, your research and even why, uh, even more importantly, why it is that it's so important to measure household water insecurity. Yeah, so I mentioned that I'm trained as an anthropologist and as a nutritionist, Cornell uh, University. I didn't say anything about being trained in water because I have taken it much uh, for granted for a long period of time. So I'm gonna take like the next 45 seconds to remind us all of how special water is. So maybe there are a couple of drops of water that have been found on Mars, but nowhere in the solar system and certainly not in the universe have we found water in such abundance as we have here on this blue planet. And not only that, we come to life in a sea of water. And when we land on dry land, even sitting here now, something like 60% of your body is composed of water, 61% for Adrian now. And we drink it, exactly. But we do much more with that. We, we grow food with it. We prepare food with it. We need water to wash our dishes after we've eaten to keep our grubby little kids from being not so grubby as well as ourselves. There are so many meanings that water has. I mean, there's hope. new life is found in, in, in religion with water. And it's an important part of Muslim life five times a day. But at the same time that water is that important, four billion people 
face water scarcity at least one month of the year. And this is just based on, on satellite data. And many more than that have problems with water access. So flooding can be just as harmful as drought and poor water quality. I mean, Flint probably comes to mind, but that is far from the only place where we have concerns about, about water, the quality of our water. And with all of this importance and all of this problems around water, global stability is jeopardized. So you might have heard of the World Economic Forum, fancy people in Davos. They have this uh, cheerily titled report that comes out every year, the Global Risks Report. And 2020 has the dubious honor of water touching on the top five risks for the first time. So in, in 2019, water was in four of the five. In 2018, it was three or four of the five, but now water is clearly a piece of the five top global risks. There are lots of reasons to worry about <clears throat> water. So going back to this Kenyan study where I had NIH gave me a million bucks to study food insecurity in the first thousand days. And to use a technical term, we were measuring the heck out of food insecurity. So you can measure food insecurity easily with what's called the Household Food Insecurity Access Scale. That's a mouthful, but what it means is it's, it's nine questions. And I, I would ask Adrian, how frequently in the last month did he worry about food? Did he have fewer meals? Did he go to sleep hungry, et cetera? So we were asking that frequently. And that was with my nutrition hat on. But with my anthropology hat on, I wanted to make sure we were asking the right types of questions for this population. So I asked them, what shapes how you feed your infant? And we gave women cameras. They went and took pictures of things that influenced how they fed their infants and came back and then we had an interview in Swahili. So, so tell me why you took a picture of this tree. Tell me why you took a picture of X, Y, and Z. And to my surprise, a bunch of pictures of water were coming back. So people were talking about having to leave their child to go fetch water when the, the terrain was precarious. People were talking about well, many, many examples, and here's just one. So this is a picture that a woman took of cloudy water, and the water is cloudy because sewage was coming in it from an upstream prison. And the woman said she was torn between buying water and buying food. So on one hand, she could buy clean water, but then have no money to buy food, or she could use this water and use her money to buy food. I mean, impossible decisions. Another um, really compelling photo is a woman, she asked for this picture to be taken of her, I think her daughter took the picture. And this is her water being stored in the house. And she said, she explained how if there isn't water in the household that her, her spouse would beat her. It's like uh, if there's not water for the bathroom or if there's not water for laundry. So we think about water for washing, I mean, sorry, for drinking. But what we started to see in Kenya by listening to moms and their stories is that water was touching all these other aspects of life. Now, I, I told you food insecurity experiences are easily quantified. That's with that big mouthful household food insecurity access scale. And in fact, that scale basically is how we keep track of sustainable progress towards sustainable development goal two. So we, we don't want the world to be hungry how do we know if the world is hungry? We ask representative samples of the population these questions, and then we can see how does, how does household hunger vary across the world? This is important. Everyone pays attention to this indicator. At the same time, there's, there are other indicators. As you'll see, and there's an SDG goal for water, and the high-level panel is saying, you know, we can't measure, we can't manage what we can't measure. Business people know that. Sometimes public health people forget that. And we have these major gaps in how water is measured. And so I'm looking at women in Kenya, little baby Aurora is with me. We're seeing like, wow, what's happening with, with these moms? Like it's really hard to have a little baby just to begin with, let alone fetching water from places like this. Can we quantify these experiences with water insecurity? So I guess the question is, how do you do that? I mean, how do you capture something which is so universally embedded in someone's life, like water? So it's universally embedded, but it also kind of has a lot of cultural particularities as well. So like the very short answer is, very carefully, 
the <laughs> um, slightly longer version of that is you get together 30 of your closest friends and or scholars who you don't really know, but also are interested in this. And so that's what we did. This is a, a meeting that we had at, at Northwestern uh, four or five years ago. These are um, clinicians, you know, doctors, epidemiologists, geographers, anthropologists, nutritionists. And we identified, I don't know, 35 candidate items that we thought would be universal, that would be understandable, and that would work in really diverse places. And then we asked those questions in 28 sites. So you can see some of these places are cosmopolitan, you know, like Kathmandu, these, these are apartment buildings we were asking people. Lebanon, it was mixed housing, some places really dry, there's flooding, there's intermittent, um, intermittent drought. And so these were places that we picked to really stress test these questions, would they work? And if you're interested, you can read all the technical details about how we landed on the final questions that we did. I kind of like to use this cartoon like, and then a miracle occurred and out came the final 12 items magically, or with a whole bunch of blood, sweat and tears is the, the real backstory. All this is to say is that we identified sort of the 12 items that most powerfully predicted water insecurity and that everyone could understand. And all the questions, they're, they're quite simple questions. It's, I would ask you, Adrian, if I was inter interviewing you, how often in the last four weeks have you worried about water, your water situation? How often have you been unable to wash hands because of problems with water? How often did you go to sleep thirsty? And then those, are, those questions are scored. If you said never, it would be a zero. If you said you were always angry about your water situation, you would be scored a four with 12 items. 12 times three is 36. And these questions only take three minutes to answer. So it's, it's an arithmetic question, you know, it's easy to score and it's short. And so now the fun can begin. And so, you know, I just curious when you are trying to capture that information, are you using an app or something? I saw a code there. I mean, a, you know, is there a QR code? Is there some, how do you do that and have it homogeneous across the whole, all the 28 sites or however many you have? Yeah, so we did, um, you know, we developed the questionnaire and then we developed a manual to go with it. And then, I mean, I had a study coordinator here who traveled to a bunch of places like Congo, uh, many Ethiopia, many places. So we would kind of stabilize on, on how they were asked. And then the data were sometimes collected on paper and sometimes collected with like a, a, a tablet. So Got both. It. Yeah, I'm just curious because it must be a real problem about how to collate all of that information and keep it sort of stabilized across those sites. Uh, so that's great. Uh, I wanted to remind everyone out there, now is a good time to start thinking of your questions and put them in the Q&A. So feel free to ask anything you like. Uh, so I assume you've now, after a few years, collected quite a lot of data. What does it show? I mean, what have you learned from the HY scale uh, thus far? Yeah, I will say um, to your point about scale development, it's kind of like if I knew how much work it would have been go, like, going into it, I'm not sure I would have, you know, it sounds great to have 8,127 households, <laughs> but it also is 8,127 households. So scale development was tough, but now like the fun can begin because the, the tool is solid and it's telling us a lot and it's exciting. So we know, and this should look familiar to you, this is kind of the conceptual framework we were thinking of, of how food insecurity would impact well-being. It turns out water touches on all of these aspects of life and in many other ways because food you only eat, but water you ingest but you also bathe with it. You also use it for your hairdressing business. You also use it for a car wash. You use it to bathe your kids. So it's, it's very, uh, it's a complex substance. Um, I have peer reviewed articles on all of these pathways. So please, I'm very happy to answer your questions about how this, these might shape any of these that are interest. I'll just show you one output. So um, we collected these data before anyone had heard of COVID. I didn't know what it was at the time. This is from data from 2018, basically. Um, one of the items in HY scales, how often were you unable to wash your hands because of problems with water? And you can see of these randomly selected households, about half, oh, sorry, about a quarter 
of the population couldn't wash their hands because of problems with water. So this isn't, I didn't wash my hands or I didn't wanna wash my hands. It's that I did and I couldn't. Which suggests that water insecurity is a big problem. Um, yeah, so I, again, I'd be happy to talk about all those pathways, but I, I do wanna talk a little bit more about what's next. Yeah, and I was, it's funny you mentioned COVID because that was gonna be one of the questions I had sort of afterwards. Maybe we'll come back to it because it is, of course, for all data collection, COVID has represented both an enormous opportunity, but a problem, right? Of suddenly the norms being thrown a little bit uh, into a new normal. So maybe we'll come back to that loop back. I did want to note on that chart, I'm imagining in certain cultures where ritual hand washing, you know, as a cultural historian, I'm thinking, what do people do? I mean, you know, especially in Islam where, you know, washing the hands and the body is just such an essential part. And I wonder how that shifts and produces different tensions, whereas in other cultures, maybe that's not the case. Anyway, that was just my remark. So, okay, you've collected data, you've got your group up and running uh, and it's coming in. Uh, you know, if you have to prognosticate, what is the future for this? Because of course you're gonna be, you know, right now you're producing data which is becoming more and more temporally longitudinal, right? It's going to give you trends as opposed to just snapshots. I'm curious, how do you see using this in the future? What are the possible even policy outcomes of it? Because we know you're working with the UN and other uh, folks. What does it look like to you? Yeah, and policy is where I really hope to make the impact. I mean, I'm, thank you, Adrian, I'm tenured now. He signed the letter. Um, so the, you know, the peer-reviewed manuscripts are fun and, and interesting, but you saw that there are billions of people who are impacted by water insecurity and, and this, this part of water insecurity has not been quantified. I mean, up until now, people, and, and these are policymakers, these are engineers, these are public health people have been measuring water availability. But like, you know, Lake Michigan is not far from me, but being able to see Lake Michigan or in Kenya, being able to see Lake Victoria doesn't mean that I have enough water for all my needs in my house. And so what I'm hoping and what is happening, thank you, God, is all of these organizations are paying attention to the need for to understand human experiences of water access and use. And so like I'll be briefing the the kind of the head honchos at World Bank mid April because they're seeing this as a, as a missing piece of of their understanding of water and security. I mean, they have a portfolio of billions of dollars of water infrastructure that they're you know cycling through every year. This is an important outcome. UNESCO has uh, realized this as well. So um, Gallup World Polls, I, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they have this amazing ability of doing nationally representative sampling of 140 plus countries every year. And um, while we know which questions to ask to assess water insecurity, it's quite, a, <laughs> quite an endeavor for a single person to manage 8,000 households, let alone, I mean, and that's in 30 countries, let alone for the world. So UNESCO, Gallup, and Northwestern have put their their hat, not another, put their heads together and are benchmarking uh, water security for half the world's population. So these data are coming in from 2020, and it's fascinating. I mean, we're I feel so like lucky and privileged to have these glimpses into what water security looks like for China, for India, for Brazil, for much of Africa, and this is kind of like the slide that makes my mom proud. So like, this is with the UN ambassador, uh, UNESCO's ambassador to the UN. So we'll be working to produce the first global picture of water security at the, at the household level. I mean, that's, oh, sorry, go ahead. And so, I mean, to that end, like I've been spending the last year, I should have been in Rome and Paris and Geneva and London and Nairobi and Cairo to be like talking with these donors, uh, you know, or talking with these companies who really see the value in this, but for now it's a lot, it's a lot of zooming. Because what we want to do is to continue the work with Gallup and UNESCO so that, as you were talking about, like so getting a longitudinal picture, seeing how water security changes both with like economic shocks, but also like natural shocks. Because the, the sort of the end in mind is to get age-wise this the scale, the household water and security experiences scale to be the the, the the standard that which we measure the world's water situation in the same way that 
we measure food insecurity experiences, that's the gold standard. You know, we, we wanna do that for water. And it's, it's exciting and we're like kind of on the cusp and, and I'm pleased that this can reflect so nicely on Northwestern. I mean, in the Global Strategy Task Force, we talk about wanting to increase leadership in the world's ideas networks. We wanna advance the intellectual agenda and enhance global partnerships. And I would say that the HY scale kind of ticks all those boxes. And in so doing, it also advances the goals of Weinberg. I mean, we've got, we've got data. But we also have sort of manifestations of water security across cultures that then give insights into the very nature of the world in which we live. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions and, um, and or observations. Thank you. Well, we have a couple of questions. So first is from Brian Burnick. Hi, Brian. Uh, recognize the focus of the first uh, thousand days of a child's life, but what about the right and impact to water security for adolescent health? Uh, they seem to be perhaps a neglected population. Uh, what do you think about that? Oh, it's so true. I'm so glad that you mentioned that. I think the adolescents are indeed a neglected population. And one of the cool things about Gallup data is that they, the age of adult, it's adults, but adulthood starts at age 15 for Gallup sampling. So we will have um, the first perspective on adolescent water insecurity in the next couple of months. That's great. Uh, and, sorry, one thing, just no. one, um, is that adolescents are often responsible for fetching the water. So, you know, little, it's too heavy for little, little kids in that first thousand days, certainly, but even under fives, it's just too much. But what we see is that kids, adolescents are missing school, for example, to fetch water and it's often girls more than boys. Um, they're also helping their family with food and water. So sometimes that means like helping pay water bills or, or waiting when the tanker truck comes. So thank you for that. And that's a great point. I was gonna say, you mentioned that women are responsible. I have a, an impressionistic view that uh, in a lot of the world, and maybe I'm thinking about particular sections of it, so correct me if I'm wrong, that somehow women are connected to water. And, you know, because you're focusing on mothers, I think that's an obvious connection, but I think even more generally, just water collection in certain populations seems to be something we associate with women. Is that true or is that a pre prejudice that I have? No, and, and there are like a, a number of different ways that we can think about water and, and women. So just physiologically, women have more water in their body. Um, in terms of acquisition, it generally is a women's woman's responsibility, both for acquisition and allocation. Mm -hmm. So like you saw that one side, like that mom was going to make sure the husband got water first. But on top of that, so many household chores that fall to women are water intensive. So, I mean, laundry is a big one, but cooking, cleaning, mm -hmm. but, but also there's just like a lot of um, in like historical and cultural and religious, like there's like Mama Wati and, and, and uh, I mean, so many like literature references, mermaids, I mean, <laughs> like the, the connections between women and water run deep. Yeah, <laughs> literally. Uh, uh, I was curious about uh, also the US, there's a question from Paul Larson about, uh, you know, and I had a similar question in my mind about you know, a lot of what you're doing is looking, obviously, and you should, at the most insecure places in the world, but you did mention Flint. And so there's this question about, uh, you know, does your research or do you intend to apply this scale to developed economies as well as developing economies or, or situations? And, and do you have any preliminary thoughts on that? These are great questions. So, I mean, I am so proud that we are benchmarking like water in half the world's population. And I want more data because I'm thirsty for data. And you know, kind of the next step is to get this into high income countries. So we've done the cognitive interviewing and kind of preliminary, like do these questions work in the Netherlands, Bulgaria, England, the US multiple populations, including, including Flint, including New Orleans and including rural North Carolina and all signs. And, and it has been implemented. Actually, it has been implemented in Canada in the Six Nations community. So there, uh, it's a, a tribal region in Ontario. And this, um, so the HY scale was implemented right before COVID happened. And then everything was shut down with, with COVID and people were not paying their water bill. 
and the the um, the the provincial government was going to turn off the water in these in this community, and they used the HY scale to say like, hey, look at how much water insecurity we have in this community. Like we can't turn the water off. Look at this water insecurity data. And so it was used for advocacy and it, and it prevailed. Like they, the, the municipalities stepped in and didn't turn off the water because they had these data. Great. This is, I'm telling you because I was like, look, it's not just peer reviewed articles. <laughs> it's like having an impact in the world, but also it suggests that this works in high income countries. So my hope is, is that we'll be able to raise the funds to get Gallup to implement HYs globally. Mm -hmm. And I just saw the question, I didn't phrase the actual question. Do you have an inkling about where in the US people may be most insecure as a, you know, maybe that's not data so much as just your sense having looked at all the data you do have? Yeah, my like intuition, my water, my water divining wand. Your, yes. More places than you would think. And that's, that is not um, pinning down to geography, but one of the surprising things about the United States is it's it's called plumbing poverty. So there are millions of houses that actually don't have plumbing going to them. And then of the houses that do have plumbing, a lot of people have 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 their water turned off or yeah, or 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 never had it turned on for a, a variety of reasons. Um, where we see generally it's people who are already socially marginalized. Um, so it can be right in our own backyard. And, and in fact, we're doing some work in Evanston with a community organization here where we're finding people even in Evanston don't have water security. Yeah, and I mean, obviously if you can't, you know, if you can't, oh, put it this way, you want to figure out what we're doing in the developed or high income economies in order to know in which directions maybe to help others generate security, because if we're getting it wrong, we don't want to replicate bad practices in the ways we implement things in other countries. Uh, there was a question too about how does this link up with other research in Northwestern? Uh, this is obviously an intersectional area, and I'm just curious if you have collaborators across the university you might want to mention. Yeah, I, I have a number of collaborators across the university, I mean, in, in different institutes and centers, but I also married well. So Julius Lux, he's an associate professor of chemical and biological engineering. Um, in between getting interrupted by our kids at dinner, we also sometimes talk about our work and water has been something that we've talked about for a long time. So he's a synthetic biologist. What that basically means is getting DNA and RNA to do things that are, are useful for example, like making a COVID vaccine but also for testing water. And what his group has done is to develop a new way of, of, die, of like in short, like a pregnancy test for water. So it's, I mean, there are lots of ways of detecting um, problems in water, but usually it involves taking a sample, sending it to a lab, having a lab run it, and then getting the results back. And that takes time and that often takes money. So these diagnostic tools they're quick, they're under an hour, they're a couple of bucks, and they're working on like figuring out a lot of different analytes. So right now they can do arsenic and lead and copper, maybe fluoride too, don't quote me on that. But the point is there's a lot of um, possibility for advancing our metric, our, our, our ability to measure these really fundamental things. We think it should be democratized. I mean, it's not, it shouldn't just be for people who can have the wherewithal to get these samples, you know, all this stuff, but in fact, just pregnancy tests for water. And that's my most exciting collaborator. You mentioned uh, that it took time and money uh, and you, I think referred to some of the funders that uh, support this work, but is there anything you could say about just where does the support for this type of work come from? What is the, is it from federal funding? Is it international? Uh, just to give people an idea of the infrastructure of this. Yeah, so um, UK Aid it now has a new name in the last year, but it's kind of like USAID, so United States Agency for International Development, mm -hmm. cares a lot about um, food security especially, but I'm helping them to see the connections between water and food security, of which there are many. Um, NIH, National Institutes of Health, care a lot about um, health outcomes, so they helped me to develop the scale that we did. I didn't even talk about this, but we developed a scale first for Kenya before we took it internationally. And then UKA similarly sees the value of, of measuring these things. 
But as now that we have the scale up and running, like the, the, the penny is dropping for a lot of agencies, like Unilever, like Unilever works in all 140 countries and saying like, oh, we do dry shampoo. We do like food that can be prepared with less water. We, we can think of laundry soap that isn't as bubbly and rinses out. So there's some interest from the corporate sector mm -hmm. as well as, you know, like I was saying, the bank, I mean, they wanna make sure that, well, in fact, I mean, the World Bank really wants to make sure that their investments are sound, but um, so do government officials. So Lord Zach Golds Goldsmith, he's the British foreign minister. He's talking about HYs at the last World Water Week. He's saying like HYs, tell us by Northwestern, is keeping people accountable. And that's that's uh, attractive for a number of reasons. Yeah, I mean, you're, I can't remember what you said at the beginning, but if you can't measure it, you can't actually solve the problem. You know, you need to have that in order to even conceive the the question you're trying to answer, and then you can try and find solutions. Yeah. So that may, rings true. Uh, this is maybe along those lines. Uh, uh, the question is, and you answered this a bit with the Canadian example, but has your data been used? You know, around the world. In other words, you have another example about how it had this policy effect, maybe even a, one you didn't expect that uh, came out of the use of your data. Yeah, um, well, maybe. So the scale is pretty new. I mean, the paper was only published in 2019 mm -hmm. and the world's been turned upside down for kind of half the life of this, of this scale. Um, so I think the, the, the impact that we saw in Canada was probably the most exciting. But what we're starting to see is um, agencies using this as a standard. So I, I got an email this morning, UNICEF is um, implementing a large scale survey in Tanzania to understand the impact of COVID. And they, they wanna be sure that experiences of water access and use aren't, aren't forgotten in the sense of how, you know, just how we're seeing how it's so intrinsic to, to COVID preventative behaviors. Well, that links to another question. I'll come back to the COVID in a second. I still want to ask about that. But there's a wonderful question here about how does water insecurity correlate to the food insecurity? And I suppose the, 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 the other question would be if and where they don't, you know, what does that mean? That would Because it would seem the natural thing would be, I think, to assume they do correlate and where they might not would be an interesting anomaly. Anyway, I don't know if anything in that question comes uh, comes to mind. Yeah. Well, whoever these people are who are asking questions, I mean, please come work in my research group because these are exactly the things that we are pondering. Um, so we are seeing really strong relationships with water and food insecurity sometimes, but not always. Now, water is needed to grow food. So that's like a, a really big connection, but we also need water to prepare food. So some of my Kenyan moms were talking about how they had the powder for um, making porridge, it's called uji. They had the like uji, unga ya uji, but they didn't have the water to actually make the porridge. So there's food production, then there's food preparation. Those are two connections. But sometimes people dismiss measuring food insecurity or water insecurity and say like, Ugh, it's just poverty. You know, it's just poverty. And it's not. And I, I don't have this in my slides. Um, UNESCO hasn't approved the release of these data, but we, you know, we have data now from 20 countries of nationally representative data. And if you can imagine income ter uh, quintiles, so the lowest 20% up to the highest 20%. So there are bars. And what we see is water insecurity is highest amongst people who are poorest and it slowly goes down, but it never disappears from the, the richest 20%. And what that says is that like water insecurity is different from poverty and it's different from food insecurity. Like rich people living in really dry places also, you know, their pipes break down. I mean, they're, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. So sometimes we see it and sometimes it's really powerful. Like, you know, drought, it just wipes out crops. I mean, and you don't need to measure that. Like, let's not measure things we don't need to measure. But when you see like in, in Flint, people don't want to boil pasta in their lead water. That makes sense. And they therefore becoming food insecure. Yeah. I think in the question, I'm trying to formulate this question. I think there's a number of sort of ideas about how, 
you mentioned it before, I mean, how does this interact with COVID in the sense that uh, I think on the one hand, the data will change, right? There will be an external factor which will probably change a lot of data of this sort as it's been collected. But maybe even more practically, how does water insecurity perhaps produce another barrier to, you know, not conquering, that's the wrong word, but sort of trying to deal with COVID or coronaviruses in the future? I mean, it's just a hot mess, right? Like if you can't wash your hands, like that's number one thing, wash your hands. Number two, shelter in place. Like if you don't have water coming to your homestead and I'll tell you, it's not fun to queue for water. Like people, like people are kind of jostling a little bit here and there getting closer and closer. And like, I'm gonna maybe move your jerry can a little bit out of my way, Adrian. sorry, but I got a bunch of kids at home that I gotta, yeah. And, and I mean, fights break out at water, water spigots all the time. People steal stuff from your house when you're out, you know, standing in the queue for water. So those two kind of pillars of COVID prevention, sheltering in place, washing hands. I mean, those are, those are hard to do without water and security. And I think that's another reason why the scale is catching on is people, you know, international agencies are seeing like, we need to understand this water and security situation as a you know, precipitating greater COVID infection. So maybe one further question. Uh, I'm curious, and this, uh, you know, you can answer this however you want. How do, how do you see your research interfacing with undergraduate education? I mean, uh, you know, I know you're involved with global health studies. I know you're involved with environmental sciences, environmental uh, EPC, environmental policy and culture, other things like that, the Center for Water Research. But is there, you know, when you're teaching undergraduates, how do you, you know, what's the name of a course you offer maybe or something like that? Or, or is there anything you could tell this group about that? Lots. So I teach a course called Turning Your Numbers into a Story. And with that, we take data, like two years ago, we used data from a, a large study in, in Tanzania. A year before that, it was data from Kenya. This year, I'm going to try to use Gallup data. And we're going to turn those numbers into various stories. And that's a success story. It's a hard class to teach, I will say, because it's not like, you know, it's like figuring out uh, statistics on, in real time. There's not answers in the back of the book. But those have turned into peer, uh, several peer reviewed publications. I also teach a class called um, Biocult what, Biocultural Perspectives on Water. Maybe security is in there, but it's biocultural and it's water. And so we're understanding both what water means with when it's in the body, but also outside of the body. And that also um, turned into a peer reviewed uh, paper on coping strategies for water and security. I'm a big believer on like getting students' hands dirty. To, <laughs> this is not even intended with data. And that's what that's how that's how it comes alive. That's how it came alive for me as an undergrad. And so you know, getting their hands dirty and then actually turning into peer review publications. I'm I'm a firm believer on that. And people are you know in the good old days would be going to the field. Yeah. Well, I mean, you basically just gave a living example of what I, I speak to many people about with the data revolution we're in. We need people who can analyze data effectively and then speak about it effectively. It's not just a matter of collection, it's a matter of collection and analysis, but then also the rhetoric about how you choose to deploy data. And I think that's those are some skills that undergraduates can use, whether they move into this area or whether they move into other areas. So it's a really interesting way to get transferable skills. So thank you for your teaching. So, and thank you for this. I think this was terrific. It was wonderful to hear about the insights of your research, the policy connections and all you do around the globe. And I hope we're all traveling again soon so that you can go uh, knock on those doors of the, the politicians and the others uh, to convince them that this is really uh, a watershed, no pun intended, in the history of understanding how things like this can impact the world. And we're proud to be a part of that. So thank you very, very much for taking the time to spend with us today. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, audience. So to all of you who tuned in, uh, we hope you found this a valuable way to spend uh, a few minutes in your day. Uh, we thank you for all your support, uh, you know, whether you're alumni, parents, friends, et cetera. Uh, Weinberg College depends. You are, in a sense, uh, the, the water that makes this mill work. So thank you so much for everything you do by investing in us, investing in faculty, 
uh, and making research like that of Professor Young possible. So thanks again to Sarah from all of us at Weinberg College and Northwestern University. Have a great day.